Hi there. Okay, so we're on to section three of memory. This is the last section of memory, and it is about long-term memory. So long-term memory, we've obviously we've looked at short-term memory already and kind of what that is. Long-term memory is the idea that your brain technically has this unlimited capacity to store information, which I know is hard to believe because as humans we forget things all the time. That suggests we don't have an unlimited capacity, but we do have an unlimited capacity of storing information. It's just all about can we actually get it in there, keep it in there and be able to get it back. So in this one, we're going to look at um, the different methods of kind of storing information in long-term memory, which are rehearsal, elaboration and organisation, which actually pretty much do what they say in the tin and are really useful for the fact that you should be studying for exams just now. These are the kind of methods you probably are already using. You just haven't really put kind of words to it yet. OK, so re rehearsal is information that is repeated over and over again. Basically, the more times you say or do something, it will get transferred to long term memory. OK, it depends on what kind of information is being memorized. But generally, rehearsal results in fairly shallow encoding. What this means is the memories that are formed while they are in long term memory do tend to be a bit short lived and can be quite hard to retrieve. So, for example, I have stared at this GIF for probably the grand total of about an hour in my entire life, like just this one single GIF because I was choosing it, making the PowerPoint and that sort of thing. I still, if I was asked tomorrow, can you please sign language? How are you doing? Not a clue. Nothing. Even think... though I've seen it over and over and over again and I know how to do it right now. Nothing. I don't think about the fact that in primary, I was amazing at reciting Burns poetry. <laughs> Can't do it now. It was there. It was there for about 20 minutes. I did it. It's gone. Mm. So rehearsal is useful for some types of learning. Like this is why we recommend again flashcards. But the whole point of flashcards is you have mm -hmm. to use them regularly. You have to rehearse a lot in order to get the information in. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, we, we, you could ask the question, well, why do you make us rehearse stuff at all? Is because we know that it does work. OK, mm -hmm. eventually it does work. I was made for seven years to recite my, my times tables in front of my entire class. I know my times tables pretty well now. OK, so we know that rehearsal does work. It's just a long and slow and tedious process. It's not the funnest way to learn stuff. Uh, another way of doing it is elaboration. So the idea that you kind of put more information into something to make it kind of stick in your brain more. Something that you see those people who can remember really long lists of things is they tend to say they're making a story of like they're walking through their house. They're seeing these different objects They're basically adding a story to the list of things that they've got. And as a result of that, it's causing them to remember it more because they've almost got more of an emotional attachment to it. So they think more about it, they can kind of bring it to their mind more. Simple things like creating a mnemonic as well is a good example of elaboration because you're kind of building onto it. You're saying, I've got these facts, let's build into it, let's make it more memorable by adding adding these things to it. It's what we find with most uh, emotional things that happen mm. to us. It's not like we forget them. Oh yes, I forgot that uh, I was dumped 18 years ago by this person and I had my heart broken. No. Of course I remember this. I'm making a fictional incident for your information. OK, I'm not bitter. No, I'm not at all. Um, but no, is the, the idea is the more emotion attached to something, you're going to remember it with far more clearer detail. So the more personal you find something, the better, which is why, again, as learning, we do try and make things as personal as possible. But it's very, very difficult with certain things like respiration. How on earth can we make that possible personal to you? How can we make you have an emotional connection to that? So rehearsal it is then. Uh, the final method of organisation, this is probably one a lot of you use as well, is just taking things and kind of splitting them up into logical categories. So doing things like mind maps and flowcharts and saying, well, I've got this thing, I'm going to branch off of it and look at this specific aspect and this aspect and this aspect um, and kind of going in that way. This is a way a lot of people tend to learn is through organisation. And it's one um, that if you are or organise things kind of logically, it makes it much easier to transfer them from short term to long term memory. I'd say that Miss Armstrong definitely learns via mind maps because looking at a lot of the things that she does with the higher human stuff, mm -hmm. it's about big mind maps at the end of key areas, at the end of units is definitely a way that works for her in her learning. Whereas I am far more of a rehearsal person. I have an essay writing thing that I do. I just write essays on a topic over and over and over again and eventually I learn it. Now you can think about um, organisation as well, because so this is linked to organisation. Have a look at the two lists there. Have a read through them. Pause now, um, because there is one list that should be easier to read than the other. And the answer should be list B. OK, and that's because it's sorted into three fr fruits, three items of clothing and three seasons, as opposed to list A, which is just a jumble of stuff. OK, organisation, if you organise stuff into categories, again, it's not chunking. It's not the same as that. It's just about being able to form more connections between topics, I think, inside your brain and the more connections you have the easier a memory is to form and to retrieve. 
Okay, so the final thing that we're going to look at in this memory stuff is the idea of memory retrieval. Because obviously you can make all these memories in what if you want, but if you can't bring them back and actually use them, there is utterly no point in having them as a memory. So it's really, really important that you are able to access memories, obviously memories that you have used less. So maybe something you did when you were seven. It's going to be a lot harder for you to retrieve that memory than something that you did yesterday or something that you maybe done 10 years ago, but you think about it all the time. So there's lots of different ways we can do it. For a lot of people, it's different stimuli, different things in life can actually bring back a memory. I know myself, there's a lot of things I don't think about, but somehow Miss Mill says something and suddenly I remember this thing and I was just like, oh, I, I didn't know I knew this thing, but because I heard something that linked to it, it kind of made sense, which links us into contextual cues. Mm, I've got a really weird contextual cue. It's every time I walk into Boots, I think back to one of the times when I walked into Boots and I got shouted at by a man for not holding door open. Hmm. I was 15. That's uh -huh. one. Contextual cues are the idea that certain smells, tastes, experience, sights, sounds, basically sensory experiences, what they can do is they can trigger memories. They say like smell is one of the most potent one of these. Um, like when you smell something and suddenly you're transported back to a time like when you were five years old. Um, but these are contextual cues. It, what it's doing is it's setting the same context as when that memory is formed. So when I walk into Boots, of course, I'm just thinking about that time that that man yelled at me uh, when I was walking through the door because basically I'm walking into the same shop that it happened in with the same sort of fluorescent lighting and that sort of thing. Whereas I know when I was studying for my hires, I listened to the same song when I was doing each of my hires. So when I was sitting in like my higher French exam, I was sitting and generally that song was going through my head, but actually it made me remember a bit more. Of course, all my, my French exam was Canada to ton anniversary. Not <laughs> the best one, no. <laughs> Okay, uh, this little bit is extra. I'll just skip ahead if you're not interested in it. Um, it's an example of kind of context contextual cues slash just a really interesting example of memory retrieval. Uh, this is Trevor Morrison picture uh, in there. He grew up on the Isle of Butte. Um, now, Saint, uh, when he was 10 years old, a former resident of the abandoned St Kilda Islands taught him traditional songs from St Kilda. Now, for those of you who do not know, St Kilda is way out in the Atlantic Ocean. It's British territory. It's basically this rock slash island thing and it had a community up until about 19 i want to say 1920 something um but it might have been 1930 something that it had a community and then it was abandoned basically because life there was unsustainable and so the people from st kilda came to britain and one of them was living on the isle of butte and taught him as a 10 year old uh, some traditional songs that basically nobody except for st kildans knew uh, now later on uh, suffering from ill health, Trevor was admitted to a care home. At the age of 72, he began playing the songs that he was taught on the, as a boy on the piano. He had totally forgotten them in the middle of his life, like couldn't access them at all, utterly unretrievable. He would wake up some nights in the care home, write the music on the walls in case he forgot what he had just managed to remember. So something in his brain was happening to actively retrieve those memories. He was suffering from an ill health disorder, I think, that was affecting his brain. And it basically might have been slightly not clearing stuff out, but basically allowing connections that had not been fired up in a while in order to fire up again. Uh, one of the care home nurses recorded Trevor playing the songs and passed the recordings to a musician, knowing that these were the only recordings in the whole world of these songs, because this was from a community where the last known person from that community died in, I want to say 1960, but I might be wrong there. Um, and essentially no one else in the world would know these songs except for Trevor Morrison being taught them as a 10 year old boy. The musician that got it made an album out of the recording and um, added other classical scores to it. If you buy or listen to this album, you actually notice there's something really nasty about the quality of the piano that's on there. And that's because that is the actual Trevor Morrison playing in his actual care home piano. And that's there. And I think that's just an amazing example of your brain. You just don't know what's in there. You have no idea what's in there at all. So it's about this idea of, well, what have you stored? But also, can you access it? I just think is an amazing thing. All right, uh, back into the science of it, though. Okay, so summary of long term memory. The last part of memory is, uh, first of all, we've also got the idea of unlimited capacity. Your long term memory has an unlimited capacity. It can store as many things as you physically want it to do. You just need to use it well. OK, uh, long term memory lasts for a long period of time. Again, I can't specify the time because it could be maybe you're remembering stuff from when you were two years old. Who knows? In terms of methods of um, using your long term memory or putting things into long term memory, the first one was rehearsal. So simply repeating information long enough for it to be encoded into long-term memory. Okay, organisation is organising information into related categories to encode them into long-term memory. 
Uh, elaboration is the idea of adding more detail and connections to kind of make the information more personal to you so you get that emotional connection which allows you to encode it into long-term memory. Mm -hmm. And contextual cues are stimuli that trigger the retrieval of a memory. So very important, contextual cues is not about forming a memory, it's about fishing it back later after it has formed. And that is the end of the memory stuff. Questions on this do tend to be largely data-based in terms of the exam. It tends to be, here's an experiment that was done on memory, uh, do some calculations on it, maybe explain uh, the technique that they used in order to um, memorize the stuff. It might be a comparison of people who use rehearsal and organization and elaboration to memorize a task, and you might be asked to explain the differences in the uh, effectiveness of that method. Um, but yeah, they tend to be quite nice. It's quite a small key area, so not compared to the next one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the next one. Uh, but yeah, we will see you in the next key area, which is about um, cells of the nervous system. Just a bit big. Which is, yes, enormous. I think it'll be something like five videos or something like that. Okay, yeah, well. so uh, hold on to your hats for that one. But we'll see you in the next key area. Uh, but hopefully you've enjoyed this little one.